I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today, you're going to learn what are the most important features to look for when you're shopping for a video transmitter, and you're going to learn what features I don't think really matter all that much. And I'll bet you're going to learn a few new things about features that you didn't already know. Now, don't be confused by the fact that there is no face of me on the screen. Uh, this content that you're about to watch was originally part of a video transmitter roundup where I tell you about the top video transmitters on the market and the ones that I think you should be looking at if you're shopping for one. And when I got done editing the video, it was like 35 minutes long. And I said, you know what? This should be two videos. So today you're getting what features to look for in a video transmitter. And tomorrow you'll get the actual like top five that I think you should be looking at. On to the content. Let's just take a quick look at the criteria that I use to evaluate these video transmitters. And although you may not agree with the priority that I put on these on these criteria, these are the criteria that sort of define all of these video transmitters. And the very first criteria, the must-have criteria for me are number one, VTX remote control, which is the generic term that I'm coining to refer to, well, we all call it smart audio, but smart audio really is a TBS specific protocol. TBS invented smart audio. Smart audio is a protocol that lets the flight controller adjust the transmit power, the channel, and so forth of the video transmitter remotely. It's how you can use the Betaflight OSD or a Tyrannus Lewis script to change those settings on your video transmitter. Smart audio is called smart audio because it very clever thing that TBS did. They input the data over the audio line instead of a microphone, or in some cases, in addition to a microphone. The idea is that they've already got an audio line there, and if you, just like your old modem used to, you know, ding, ding, you send some audio signals, and they're really digital signals, and voila, you're sending digital data to the video transmitter. But smart audio isn't the only remote control, VTX remote control protocol. Uh, Immersion RC has the TRAMP telemetry protocol, although it's called telemetry, it's really just a bi-directional serial protocol that's used to communicate and control the video transmitter. And it's essentially the same as smart audio. I'm sure there's some under the hood differences, but from the user experience perspective, it's the same. You use your OSD or you use a Lua script or something else to remote control the channel, the transmit power and so forth of the video transmitter. Some of you may be surprised or skeptical that I've got that on my must have list. And I think that's because you haven't used it yet. I took a survey a while back to try to assess the impact of smart audio and VTX remote control in the marketplace. And by a huge margin, everyone who had used it wanted it. So people commonly say, I never want to have a quad without this again. And even people who hadn't used it wanted it too. If you use it, it really will change your life. If you ever fly around other people, if you fly by yourself in an empty field with no one else around, then you can just put yourself on 800 milliwatts and whatever channel you prefer and never change it. But if you ever fly with other people, and definitely if you're a racer, you're constantly needing to change your channel and it's such a hassle. And yes, people say, oh, I can use the push button and I can change just as quickly with the push button. I don't know about you. I would much rather just look at my OSD and just see 5740 megahertz and, or down at my Tyrannus with the Lewis script and do the same thing. The push buttons, I, obviously I can do it, but this is so much easier. And the fact that I can do that while the quad is sitting out there in the field, if I crash the quad with smart audio, but the race is still going on, so I can't go retrieve it, I can turn it down to 25 milliwatts, which is where I should have been anyway, because I'm racing. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so for me, VTX remote control is a must have. Every copter that I have, which for any reason doesn't have it, annoys me and I don't like it and I want it to have it. The other must have for me is variable output power down to 25 milliwatts. And the reason for this is if you ever race, you need to be able to turn down to 25 milliwatts. Lower output power reduces interference and allows you to have more racers in the air with less interference. But for freestyle, you can crank it up and so you can penetrate trees and get more range to so 200 or 500 milliwatts. But it's got to be able to go down to 25 milliwatts. And thankfully, most of them can. In fact, 
all of the ones on this list have variable output power. There's not a single fixed output power transmitter on the list. Even the budget option has variable output power. So this is a case where you just don't have to compromise anymore. Uh, on the nice to have list, I see that I have actually made an editing error. <laughs> I've got nice to have adjustable output power. I later decided that it was a must have. So yeah, forget that. That's a contradiction. Uh, nice to have also includes pit mode. Now pit mode is a feature where the video transmitter will power up at a very, very low output power, less than one milliwatt. And the effect of this is that if you're within about, let's say six feet of the quad, you can just barely see the video. You can even just bring the quad right up to your head and hopefully the battery's not plugged in and the props don't eat your face off. But you can get very close to it. You can confirm that it's powered up. You can confirm the channel that it's on. Right? But if you power up and there's other people in the air, you're not as likely to blast them off the air. Before I have to put a disclaimer in here, a PS, a public service announcement, pit mode is not carte blanche to plug in whenever you want, regardless of who's in the air. If, if, if you plug in even in pit mode and you're close enough to other pilots who are flying, you will interfere with them. So it's, it's insurance, but it's not just freedom to power up as much as you want, at least not in my experience. I've been knocked out of the air by somebody who powered up and they were like, well, I'm in pit mode, dude. And I was like, I saw your signal. So yeah, but it's, it's nice to have, especially if you're racing with other people, especially if you're worried about overheating your video transmitter, you can power up and it doesn't get hot because it's not putting out any output power. And then you go, you know, do your stuff, go put it down, get ready to fly, take it out of pit mode and now go fly. Hmm? Very nice to have, but not, not must have. I prefer that my video transmitters take VBAT power because I like to power them directly off the battery. I don't want to worry about sizing a voltage regulator and how much current am I drawing and do I have a voltage regulator big enough on this board? If it takes VBAT power, just plug it into VBAT, life goes on. Now, it is true that powering video transmitter off of VBAT increases the odds that you're gonna have noise. So it's gotta be a good video transmitter with good filtering and maybe a flight controller with filtering built in as well. But in my case, all of those things hold true and I find that to be the best for me. It needs the ability to power up and change channels cleanly. Now this is a feature that was introduced. I think Unified introduced it first, Tramp has it as well, and so do some of the others. What it means is that when you change channels, some devices, when you change channels, they'll just sort of blast noise across the whole frequency band. Other, uh, others, they change channels cleanly, and unless you change onto somebody else's channel, you're not going to blast them. Now, really, you shouldn't be changing channels or powering up while people are flying, but if you're going to do that, <laughs> it helps to have one that changes channels cleanly. MMCX connector instead of IPEX connector. You know that little teeny tiny connector that comes on the TBS Unify and many others? but uh, you see a lot of it with Unify because Unify is so popular and it very commonly either breaks off in a crash or it stops holding. It just the thing gets loose and pops off all the time while you're flying. That thing is called an IPEX connector. It's also known as a UFL connector. I don't know what the difference between those is, but the other big thing about the IPEX connector is it's actually not rated for very many mating cycles. Click, 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 right? It's not, it, it wears out very quickly. And that's actually just a design feature. It's not, you're not supposed to be plugging and unplugging it a million times. There's a better connector. It's called an MMCX connector. It's a little bit bigger. It's, it's sturdier, it holds better, and it's rated for more mating cycles. It's a great balance between the great big SMA connector that nobody wants on their video transmitter because it's so heavy and the teeny tiny IPEX connector that's so fragile. I've seen one or two video transmitters coming out today with an MMCX connector. I hope that trend continues because I think the MMCX connector is really where we should be. And then finally, nice to have is direct solder pads. I like to direct solder stuff. These weird connectors make it hard. If you've ever had a TBS Unify where you screwed up the pigtail, what the heck connector? It's a JSTGX, I don't know. Where are you gonna get a spare? Are you gonna order one and then you're out, the, out of the air until it comes in the mail? and if you have direct solder, you just fix it with a soldering iron and you're good to go. These features are take it or leave it for me. An LED or LCD indicator on the board. Now, if it's gonna have an LED or LCD indicator, it should be a really nice clear one. But I don't really care if it has one because I wanna use VTX remote control for everything anyway. So I'm not really gonna be looking at the LEDs or LCDs. Push button adjustment. 
there's a lot of video transmitters that have remote control capability, but also have a push button as a backup. And I guess that's nice, but I don't ever intend to use that, so I kind of don't care if it has it. 5 volt output for the FPV camera. Well, in all of my setups, number one, all the cameras I'm running, they're run cams usually. They can just take VBAT directly, and that's how I usually power them. Uh, so I, I'm not using 5 volt cameras anyway. And if I was using a 5 volt camera, I would probably just power off the, off the well, if you have a Betaflight F3, for example, or it's got a filtered camera pad, or if you've got a Seal Racing F4, it's got a filtered camera pad, right? So there's, those are built with filtered power outputs for the camera. No need to use the 5-volt regulator on the VTX. It's nice to have, I suppose, and there might be cases where you would use it, but especially because all of my cameras take VBAT and they don't need 5 volts, um, I, I don't really care about this. Some of these video transmitters can be mounted on the flight control stack, so they stack on top of the flight controller. To me, this is actually not, it's not even an upside, it's a little bit of a downside. Most of my builds, I don't have enough spare room, really. If I've got a 4-in-1 ESC and a flight controller, or a PDB and a flight controller, a lot of my the frames I'm building don't have room for a third thing on top of there anyway. This idea that you're going to have a, a copter with a 4-in-1 ESC, a flight controller, a run cam split, <laughs> You know, and a video transmitter all stacked up high. Well, you basically just invented the TBS power cube, haven't you? But lots of frames can't take that many. I just prefer something that I'm going to mount on the bottom plate or the top plate. That's not really a plus for me. It's even a little bit of a minus. One of the things I'm going to talk about in this comparison is the audio subcarrier that the video transmitter uses. A uh, video transmitter can transmit audio on either 6 megahertz subcarrier or the 6.5 megahertz subcarrier. And I, if I understand correctly, that's your two stereo audio channels. If I've got that wrong, I'll find out real quick and you'll correct me in the comments. The issue here is that your receiver module is going to be listening typically on one of those subcarriers. And if the transmitter is transmitting on the other subcarrier, you're not going to hear the audio. Now, I don't actually know what subcarrier the common receiver modules receive on. I tried to look it up and I couldn't find it anywhere. But I'm going to tell you, if I could find the information, what subcarrier the video transmitter uses, and if that's something you care about, then you'll know. Finally, I don't care if the video transmitter supports L-band, and in fact, boo, L-band is illegal, you shouldn't use it anyway. None of the video transmitters in here support L-band, and I wouldn't promote them if they did.